We will continue our quest for truth today. Um, we will add to what we've talked about uh, so far in terms of kind of equilibrium behavior of fluids held by interfacial forces. And then we'll talk about how we might be able to characterize, I suppose, how they get there in the first place, how quickly. We've always said that this equilibrium behavior that we look at, which is epitomized, I think, in this figure here, that it's uh, some distribution vertically within the, the section, and it's controlled primarily by uh, interfacial forces. Uh, and those interfacial forces acting between the fluids and the solids and other fluids that are present in the system to come up with some place where the fluids get stuck. They get stuck on capillary barriers, um, which could be, well, which are really just a, a change in the gradation of the pore sizes, which are often a, due to a change in gradation of the grain sizes. One flows goes with the other. If you have small grains, they probably have small throats. And that the architecture that we have is controlled by the architecture of the subsurface media uh, in terms of getting hung up on lenses and sticking there. And that this maybe happens within the first uh, couple of weeks or a couple of months within the spill. We've only talked about it in terms of equilibrium behavior. And so if you look at this capillary pressure versus saturation graph, on the right-hand side, at the bottom right-hand side, we know that both of these curves are just due to, um, when you change capillary pressure, it will come to a new equilibrium by finding a new saturation by pushing out one of the fluids and inserting one of the fluids at, at the expense of that other fluid which is pushed out. And we talked about how we might, we can construct these figures here. But we haven't really said anything about how quickly this can occur because we've kind of taken the fact that if it spills within a couple of months, then it's there. And these things have decade-long lifetimes uh, before they get remediated, typically. Then perhaps we don't really worry about that initial time scale. Um, but of course, what we would like to know is we could like to know exactly what their paths are. Um, but the other thing which is uh, much more long term for us would be we'd like to know exactly what the form of this plume might be that would develop uh, and how that would flow downstream. And so I suppose what we will be thinking about would be if we could imagine to have some kind of sample, a core that was sitting in here and that we had a pressure gradient applied on that core, how quickly would it move downstream to a compliance point, like the example you already did? And also, you know, if we think that we're going to remove stuff by it being dissolved in water at very low concentrations, the rate that by which this will de be depleted is controlled by the rate at which fluid would flow down here at the Darcy flow velocity and, and volumetric flow rate. So that's our task for today, is to be able to look at that. So we're moving from talking about static fluids, which would act as a source. The static fluids would act not only as a source. You see the stippling as you go downstream to the right-hand side of this. The stippling here changes from being pristine upstream and not pristine downstream. Um, but the source uh, and the rate at which it would dissolve into this fluid going down to the, to the right would control exactly the, the velocity of its arrival, the timing of its arrival at some downstream compliance point. So we're going to talk about the motion of the fluids affected by stuff that might be dis present as separate phases. Uh, and so the easy way to talk about that is to talk about what we know about Darcy's law for single phase flow, first of all, and then to take that the next step to talk about uh, multiple phases. And so that's what we will deal with today. So um, we looked at the picture last time and s kind of thought with a mental picture of how we could think about this. I guess the other thing to look at is to bring this up again. We've seen this many times. Well, some of you have seen this many times. You've seen it at least a couple of times in this class. 
and that is the, the, the motion of these fluids flowing as multiple phases. I think the key on this is that uh, hot temperatures are high pressures and low temperatures, blues, are low pressures. So it's being driven by some flow from left to right. You can see the outline of the grains, kind of spherical grains in the thing. Um, and you can see that the flow is kind of intermittent uh, around these materials. And there's nothing here really to suggest that um, this is multiple fluids, but I guess you can see that these things neck down and become separated from each other. So that by that definition, there must be more than one fluid in this, right? If you get a gap between the fluids as it evolves on this flow path here, that must be perhaps air coming into the system uh, around these that's uh, allowing the, uh, the liquid to neck off and to flow through the system. So that's kind of what we're interested in being able to represent. Our simplistic view uh, is something like this. You could imagine that these pathways through the, if you took a snapshot, would look like this tortuous green pathway in a sea of red. Um, if we wanted to, uh, we're representing these different saturations that we could imagine before. Um, if this is the non-wetting fluid, then I guess this would be what we would called uh, funicular saturation. It's isolated. It's oil in a sea of water, red for water. In this saturation, roughly the saturations of the two fluids would be 50-50 perhaps. Both are connected, so as you go from the upstream to the downstream, you can get to either side completely through a red fluid or completely through a green fluid. And as you increase the saturation of the green fluid, the oil in this particular case, all of a sudden you cut off portions of the other fluid. And so this one would only flow green fluid and the red would be trapped uh, and static. And so one way we can think about this is to take this reality and to centrifuge it down so that we can look at flow, essentially uh, parallel flow in two tubes, two parallel tubes that don't really communicate with each other except they would do across this uh, interface here and that can kind of flow separately downstream. And so that's the way that we will deal with it to be able to look at this behavior. And so I, will, I could write this out or I could use notes from I guess three years ago now judging by the date on this, just to walk through this at some modest pace. And so our pace is single phase, single phase, more than one phase. We'll only look at two phases. You could have three, I suppose, if you wanted to. Um, and how do they flow uh, with, within the system? And then we'll define something that defines some kind of effective permeability for these. So Darcy's law for one flow, one, one phase. You have a core, um, you have flow through a cross-sectional area of the end, which is A. This isn't a capillary now, this is a core that includes lots of grains. And A is the end of the core, which might be you know, the size of my fist, bottom here, top here, aligned like this. It has some length, it has a head gradient across it. Uh, and we look at defining what the flow velocity out of it is. I guess we could define ahead. Uh, you, you, knew, you know Bernoulli's equation in terms of elevation plus pressure head plus velocity head. So this is what we would refer as total head. Head because they're all in units of length as you know. And one thing that we, I don't know why uh, my key is on top of that. Yeah, it's better. And so certainly we've talked about this before in terms of classifying it. These two terms here we will refer to as hydraulic head, H. And so uh, in 452, you'll have seen this expression. This is uh, hydraulic conductivity. 
its units of meters squared of velocity. I guess you can see that. Um, and if we multiply uh, a velocity multiplied through by an area, then we get a volumetric flow rate. So this is Darcy's law. And the meaning of this uh, is that we can get a flow velocity through our little sample if we know what the magnitude of the change in head, th, with dx is, just by thinking about this figure here, uh, plotting head versus length along the, the sample. And we know that there should be a minus sign in here because the velocity, which is a vector, flows in the opposite direction from the head gradient. This is a positive gradient in this quadrant, right? Positive h, positive x, so positive gradient. And so the negative sign just means that the vectoral quantity is in the opposite direction from the positive x. And so that's the way that, that we would think about this. We can also define behavior in terms of pressures, and I think you've already used that, so, it's, uh, so you've already perhaps surmounted some of this stuff. And so if we look at this diagram again with the core, uh, we could imagine that it's not horizontal anymore. We could imagine that it's inclined, that it has some elevations upstream and downstream, which are these two elevation heads. If we filled up a, a line the, the depth, the height to which the fluid would rise in that line would be a pressure head acting at this elevation and a pressure head coming out of it at the downstream end. And the sum of these two components would exactly be this term that we've defined here in terms of the, the hydraulic head. And so in the same way that we can write this magnitude of head here to describe the Darcy velocity, as we've just done it. If we substitute for the fact that the head that we've just defined is equal to an elevation plus a pressure divided by the unit weight. So if you make that substitution, then all of a sudden then we have this expression here. And so this expression includes the pressure head and the elevation. And if we wanted to, we could take this derivative here and apply it individually on each of these terms. And if we did that, so just taking this term inside here and inside here, then we end up with this. So the derivative of the change in pressure with elevation, this is just a one, perhaps that's confusing. That's just a, a one. So we take the, the derivative of pressure divided by unit weight. We could think of this just being one over unit weight. We take the derivative of x with respect to z, and we end up with this term here. And so when we talk in terms of pressures, I guess that's one thing we might move back. We can define Darcy's law either in terms of heads, which we've done here. This is hydraulic conductivity. This is hydraulic conductivity. We've exchanged the head for uh, its definition, which is in terms of pressure and elevation. And we end up with this seemingly extra term here, um, which we then have to deal with. And so what we can think of is that this um, core is oriented, we could either think of it as being oriented horizontally or vertically. And if it's or oriented one of those two directions, what exactly is this final term here going to represent? The easiest one to think about, of course, is if it's horizontal. If it's horizontal, then this ends up being the elevation. This is the velocity in the x direction. This is the pressure gradient in the x direction. And this is the change in vertical elevation with x. And so since they're both orthogonal to each other, I guess that way, x and z, then the value of this term has to be equal to 0. So this drops out, and we don't need to worry about it. If we think about the vertical orientation, and we write Darcy's law in the same way, 
it'll be the velocity in the z direction. The derivatives are with uh, dz. So this, instead of being dx, would be dz. And so if we replace this with z, I won't do that, but you get the idea. You end up with this expression here. And you end up with the same expression before, except this is dz over dz. And so this, of course, is 1. right? The, the component of dz in the z direction is equal to 1. And so this term has to uh, occur in this particular case. And so when we think about this, um, we could, for instance, take uh, the unit weight outside, and we end, end up with this extra term that attaches here. And I always refer to this as kind of the, the swimming pool term. If you rearranged it without it, I guess we could multiply both sides by um, gamma, gamma, and gamma. And so this term here and this term here is something you've seen before. This represents the, the pressure distribution in a vertical section due to the unit weight. And so in this particular case, uh, you'd think that if the pressure distribution arranged vertically, which is equal to the unit weight, uh, results in no velocity. And so if you think about this term, if you plot the pressure distribution uh, with depth in your fluid, and you find that that pressure distribution is this thick green line that is here, which is just 1 over the unit weight, then by definition, this flow in the z direction has to be equal to 0. Because it's just like being in a swimming pool. It has no excess pressure between up the top and the bottom of the pool, the pool surface and the bottom. And so there's no motive force that's making it flow. If the pressure at the base is higher than the pressure on the surface, you'd expect the velocity to be positive upwards. And if you, ex if you plotted the pressure distribution in the porous medium and it plotted below this line, then it would reference the fact that flow was occurring downwards. And so I guess the other way to think about that is if we plot head, which is equal to pressure over unit weight plus elevation, and you plotted uh, again negative z. We've always done positive z upwards. If you plotted the value of head on this, then I guess um, in terms of these curves, this one would be curve 1. This would be 2, and I guess this would be 3. And so I guess all, all you need to remember is that when we do this conversion, it, the, the mental switch between thinking in terms of heads, which is with the pressure and, and the z subtracted out. It's subtracted out because this is negative going downwards. Uh, if you look at the pressures, if you subtract the elevation head off it, then this means a positive value of head. So in other words, I guess it would, I don't want to do that. At this particular depth, this would be a positive value of head. And at this particular depth here, this would be a negative value of head. And so it matters when we're talking about um, values of pressures or heads to be able to, to do this. So intrinsically, if you look at groundwater hydrology, uh, it's a discipline which has grown up using hydraulic heads and hydraulic conductivities. And if you look at petroleum engineering, uh, sometimes in agronomy, they use pressures and permeabilities because um, the fluids that we are talking about in petroleum fluids uh, are, have compressibility and may not be just simple water as you're dealing with in hydraulic conductivity. And so the connection between those 
is in this expression here. So the Darcy flux, if you like, there's a negative sign in here, is equal to hydraulic conductivity times the change in head. I guess it's written down here. This is hydraulic conductivity. The units of this de facto are magnitudes of meters per second velocity. If you ignore the fact that we're going to deal with this um, swimming pool effect that we've talked about here with this extra term, if you're flowing horizontally, you don't have to worry about this term at all. Uh, so you could just take the value of pressure and realize that head is equal to pressure over unit weight. So if you substitute in that in there, you get this expression here. And if you <coughs> rearrange this just for this term, which is rho g, obviously, you get this. And this term here, this relationship, can be substituted for, this is a standard relationship also, that hydraulic conductivity, density of the fluid, gravitational acceleration, is equal to the permeability of the substance and its viscosity. So these terms are all defined here. This is a standard result, useful to remember. So this is a hydraulic conductivity in meters a second. It's usually for water, and it's usually at maybe 10 degrees centigrade. And so the viscosity of water doesn't change very much if you're always around the same temperature. So this is usually for water. But importantly, the permeability, which is in units of meters squared, is a function only of the porous medium. So that's probably worthwhile noting. And to confuse matters more, sometimes the hydraulic conductivity is also referred to as the coefficient of permeability. But coefficient is an important term because it's not permeability. So that means here that if you have a sandstone and its permeability happens to be a Darcy, which is 10 to the minus 12 meters squared, then it doesn't matter if oil is flowing in that or gas is flowing in that or water is flowing in that. The permeability will always, always be that number. And its effective transmission characteristics will be controlled by the viscosities of those three different fluids, but its permeability is always a function of the porous medium only. If you have that same material and you say its, hydro its hydraulic conductivity is 10 to the minus 4 centimeters a second, then that's only true for water. It'll be different if you're flowing oil or gas in it. And so that's a, an important thing to, to remember. So we'll, because we've talked in terms of capillary pressures, remember our, our diagrams that we developed last time uh, defined capillary pressure versus saturation curves. So you remember these figures from last time that we developed that looked a bit like this. We used capillary pressure. We define capillary pressure as the difference between the non-wetting fluid pressure and the wetting fluid pressure. And we had a saturation of water on the base. So th these were the curves we talked about last time in some detail. And because we define these PC versus saturation curves in terms of capillary pressure, it's probably useful for us to be able to define the transmission behavior in terms of pressures as well. And so 99% of the time, you can get away with using this expression without this extra term added into it, always for horizontal flow. And if you're dealing with vertical flow, then you might want to decide whether you want to convert it and work in terms of heads, because it becomes a bit more intuitive. But let's leave that for a moment. Take on trust now the fact that we'll work in terms of pressures. So if we're working in terms of pressures, we can think for multiple fluids that this is the behavior. We've taken our core 
We've centrifuged it, so we get our wetting fluid, I think, which is red, and our non-wetting fluid, which is green here. And they occupy the part of the core which is separated by a dividing line. When we want to define the permeability of our system, we'd like to define it in terms of the total area of the end of the core, not the area of the core that's saturated by uh, one of the fluids. And so what we can do is we can take the end of the core, which is of area A, and the, the area of the core that's saturated with the green fluid is just going to be the total area of the core multiplied by its saturation. Right? Saturation is between 0 and 1. If it's 100% saturated, then this end would all be red. If it's 50% saturated, it would look like this. If it's 0% water saturated, then it would be all green. And so this just gives us the area of the core. Likewise, we can do the same for the other fluid. Uh, we know that S1 and S2 added together must equal 1. because the, pro the saturations have to add up to one if there's only two fluids. So what we can do is we can take Darcy's law as we had, had it before. Uh, maybe we wrote it in terms of a velocity. If we wrote it in terms of a velocity, it would be, we'd lose the A, right? It would be K over mu dp dx. If we want to get a volumetric flow rate, we just multiply the velocity times an area on both sides. And that's, that gives us this. And what we realize is that A1 is just equal to, let's take this, and substitute for that. And if we do that, we end up with, I'll get rid of this because you don't need it yet. And so if we substitute from A1 being equal to A times S1, that's all this is here, then we end up with this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to recast this saturation as something that we'll call a relative permeability. And the term we'll use is KR for relative. Um, and this will be for the wetting fluid. So it'll be the relative permeability of the wetting fluid. And if we think about it, it just changes with the saturation. Um, so we could use the saturation, but we'll find out in a minute that that's not really a good use for us. So if you make this uh, substitution, fluid one, water, I guess. I think I try and be consistent. Fluid 2 is equal to the non-wetting fluid. So, so we can do that for each of the fluids. And if we do that, we end up with this relationship here. So what we could do, and these will start looking familiar to you, is that we could merely take a graph and we could put, we could plot, let me draw a separate graph. This is a, a no-brainer. We could plot the saturation of water between 0 and 1 against the saturation of the non-wetting fluid which would be the opposite between 1 and 0. And if we plotted each of these variations in saturation, I guess we would get something like this for water. And something like this for 2, right? That is just saying what we said five minutes ago, that if it's fully saturated with fluid number one, this would all be red, and if it's fully saturated with fluid number one, the saturation of fluid one would be this point here, one. So this is one, and this is zero. 
If it was half and half saturated with the two fluids, that would be this point here. The saturation of the green fluid and the red fluid would be 50%, and that would be this. And if we have none of the red, if it's all green fluid in here, we'd be at this point here. The saturation of the wetting fluid would be zero, and the saturation of the green fluid would be 100%. So that's all that relationship is. So we said before that instead of writing this as a saturation, we'd write it something called the relative permeability. So we could think about this as being the saturation, or we could also think about it as being the relative permeability. And so if we thought about it being the relative permeability, you could imagine that this curve that we have here is this curve here. It's a saturation of the non-wetting between 0 and 1, just as we had here. And I guess saturation of water between, hope I'm not belaboring this point. And this is what the curve would look like. And we could call this the relative perms, relative permeabilities. Because we said that we're going to make this substitution. We're going to call this a relative permeability. And that's what we've done. So if we did that, really what this curve is saying is that the relative permeabilities in this core kind of track across and they track proportionally to the relative saturations. And of course, that makes perfect sense because as we change the relative proportions of the core that is filled with one fluid versus the other, it just changes the linear transmission. But this is useful to us because in defining Darcy's law for both the flow of water and the non-wetting fluid, we've defined it in the terms of the total area of the core, not the saturated area. So these are the total areas of the core. We defined it in terms of a permeability that we've just said the permeability of a rock to oil is exactly the same as it is to water. So it doesn't care about the fluid. So this is just the permeability period, not the permeability to fluid one. The pressures, and the only things that would be different in the two parts of the core would be the viscosity of fluid one and fluid two would be different in the two parts. And the relative permeability of the core would be defined as a function of saturation. We could use just saturation alone because we defined it originally in terms of saturation. But the reason for not doing that is that the graphs of relative permeabilities actually don't look like this nice X. It'd be great if they could. In actuality, what the figures would look like, would they'd look a bit more like um, this. So maybe I should, you can leave your things there or not. The figures are going to look a bit more like this. They're going to look, this is, and you should be able to rationalize why this would be. So if I pull this whole diagram up, you'll recognize parts that you've seen before, and it should make perfect sense. So this is the capillary pressure versus saturation curve on the bottom that we spent the last little while uh, developing. We said that we could define some different features on it. We could define a bubbling pressure, which we called PC0. So that's the pressure we have to overcome to get the uh, non-wetting fluid, a bubble of it, to invade, start invading the system. We called this curve a, a drainage curve because we're draining out water as we push in oil, the solvent. Uh, and it goes up here. It goes up to a point which is the irreducible saturation of water. So I guess this point here was what we called SW0. saturation of water. So that's when we've, we're left with this amount of water that we can't get out of our system. And then if we back off our pressures again, we start sucking in water at the expense of the oil that we're pushing out. Mm 
But as we push the oil out, we only go back down to this other term here, which I guess is the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid, SNW0. So these two boundaries kind of matter. And so the reason for these por portions here that we draw this curve is that these regions here aren't really very accessible to us. And so we might want to not think about those in terms of the saturations. And so this curve in the middle is exactly what a real relative permeability curve would look like. It's probably a bit more complicated than it needs to be for us now, but if you think about the, the features of it, um, it should make sense. The first feature would be that we'd expect that it really can't get into these um, inviolate regions at the side because we can't get into those very easily because these irreducible saturations. This is stuff that's held there uh, by capillary forces. It's disconnected from the sides of the um, core, or the, the REV, and therefore there's no ability for us to move it very easily. And therefore when we're talking about permeabilities, which imply that movement of the fluid, then it's probably when you get to these points, the permeability should be zero. So if you think about this, um, then this term here would represent the permeability to the oil. Uh, when it's not connected between the upstream and downstream, you'd think that the permeability would be essentially zero. So this term here, then. relative permeability like the saturation varies between zero and one. And if you think about the water phase, then when that is a full, fully connected phase between upstream and downstream, then you'd think that the proportion of the pore space, which is um, green filled, is essentially very close to zero. It's not zero because it's this amount here, right? But you'd expect that largely the perme relative permeability should be completely filling the core with water and therefore being able to flow from upstream to downstream. And so um, we can think of this particular plot as being a mimic for the relative permeability plot, which is probably more reasonable than the first one we drew, right? The first one we drew was just the, this X, straight X plot between these two points, right? Between one side and the other. Um, and so that's the reason for those parts. Uh, and so if we want to be able to calculate uh, the volumetric flow through this system, then we just need to know what the core looks like. And so if we know what the core looks like in terms of its saturation, then we should have everything we need to be able to calculate what the flow through the system would be. And so if we choose in this figure What's it going to be? Shall I start using some other colors? This is future, right, I think. If we choose this point here, this point here is the saturation of water is equal to, I don't know, this would be 50%, this is 65, 65 percent. That means that the saturation of the non-wetting fluid, by definition, has to be 35%. So they both add up to 1, or decimal fractions, 0.65 and 0.35. Perhaps might be easier to think. That means that in this material, the capillary pressure, the pressure between the two different fluids is going to be whatever this magnitude here is. But we don't care about that in this particular case because it doesn't, we're not resaturating it. We're just running the core uh, as if it was two pipes on top of each other, no connection between them. Red fluids flowing under pressure gradient, green fluids flowing under pressure gradient. We don't care about the pressure difference between those two. All we care about is the pressure difference from upstream to downstream, which will be roughly the same in the two fluids. It might be offset by something, but let's not worry about that. And that means that then if we come up here, 
then the relative permeability to the wetting fluid is going to be this top number. I don't know, roughly 0.2 on a scale of uh, 1 to 0. And the relative permeability in the other fluid will be this number down here, which is not very big. And so if we want to do this calculation, relative permeability to water is going to be 0 0.2. The, rel the permeability of our rock, we said 1 Darcy, 10 to the minus 12 meters squared. Um, what else? Viscosity of water is 10 to the minus 3 Pascal seconds. And whatever the pressure gradient is, and if this is an apple, I'd imagine <coughs> that the <coughs> viscosity of the non-wetting fluid, which I don't know what that would be, but you'd have to do that. And so right from this, we've been able to take Darcy's law and define exactly what the relative proportions of the volumetric flows from the system would be. And that's, that's the calculation. It's a pretty straightforward calculation. So just to summarize, permeabilities are the same for both of these rocks. They don't change with the fluid that's invading it. The relative permeability is really a measure of if you centrifuge the fluids down, it's the kind of cross-sectional area of the core which is filled by each of those fluids. And that's kind of what relative permeability is. It's not quite as simple as that because of these effects that we'll look at in more detail in a minute. But if we know what those uh, relative permeabilities are, then we can straight away calculate the flow. The other thing that complicates matters is that since we know these capillary pressure versus saturation curves are hysteretic, so they change whether we're looking at drainage of water or imbibition of water as we increase or decrease the pressure differential between the two fluids. Obviously, as we move up these two curves, the saturations of the two fluids are changing, right? You are moving horizontally as the saturations change. So a snapshot of this core would change as the green or the, the red relative to each other shrank or grew at the expense of the other one. And so if we're changing the saturation, it means that we're moving on this curve and the relative permeabilities would change. Of course they change because they're kind of responding to the portions of the, cur the core that are resaturated. Uh, but the only time that the capillary pressures, the differences between the two fluids across this interface will change is if the saturations of the two fluids are changing relative to each other. So that's it. So that's how you'd calculate the magnitudes of the, um, the relative permeabilities and therefore the flow rates. And so if we look at that in this figure that we had before. So that's this. I won't go through this. We don't need to go through this. We've tried to explain those. This is what a real capillary pressure versus saturation curve would look like. You could imagine in terms of uh, this behavior here. So we talked about the kind of these regions here. So um, this is working with the same. Yeah, okay. Red would be water. So this would be doing that. This is 80% water. This is 20% water. And the converse, 80% non-water. And you can see what these physically mean, right? The, the fact that the, 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 the relative permeability to water on this left-hand portion goes to zero is because it's not simply connected across here. To be able to remove the water from this, you have to somehow change the saturation of water by increasing its saturation so that it goes across the full spectrum. So in this portion here, there'll be no transmission of water, hence the relative permeability is zero. Interesting enough, the, sat, the, the relative permeability of the 
non-wetting fluid is not that number, so it's not 100%, but it's slightly less. And that's because this red fluid is not continuous, but it's taking up some of the space that otherwise would be available to flow. If you drew a, a cross section across here and looked at the fact that the, the green fluid has to go around it, then a portion of the section is taken up by this water. Once you get both phases connected across the system, then the relative permeability to water will start rising up to this amount here. Um, and the relative permeability to the non-wetting fluid will drop. When you get so that the water is fully connected across the system, then you get a high relative permeability to water. And because the green fluid, the non-wetting fluid, is not connected, this goes down to zero. And so then this begs the question, what happens to the relative permeability to water in this zone? Well, it's difficult to measure, but it'll, it'll do something because it has to get to this point here. And the green one will have to do something, and it will have to get to this point here. But we don't really, it's hard to, hard to measure within this, this region. But it obviously does have, if, it, if there's a physical way to get the saturation in this region to intermediate between the irreducible saturation of water and zero, then it must have a relative permeability. And it would track along some, some trajectory like this. The other uh, <coughs> observation would be that if you added these two relative permeabilities together, so at this point here, if you added the relative permeability of water in red and the non-wetting fluid in green, you'd end up with this point here. So this is just the sum of those two values. And interestingly enough, it doesn't track across the top here. They're not equal to 1. And the reason for that is that it starts being um, part of the pore space, uh, makes the flow tortuous, so it's not uh, able to go across this. Our way of looking at this response like this, I suppose, would if we could think of the flow merely as being a porous medium, it would look like this. So on, if the bottom was our core, and this was our relative permeability, And if our core was divided into these two regions, then absolutely this was non-wetting, and this was wetting. Then absolutely our curves would be, for water, would be this. And for the non-wetting, would be this. So in other words, if, they, if we were dealing with absolutely parallel flow without a portion of kind of series flow, right? You, from this flow to get from here to downstream, you have to go first through the non-wetting fluid, then through water, then through the non-wetting fluid. And so this is kind of ser series flow. The other kind of flow, I guess, would be this, right? And if this was, if this was water, and this was the non-wetting fluid, and in both cases, we're flowing in this direction. So this is parallel, probably more than we need. And this is series flow. Then absolutely, this x plot would apply. As you shrink the amount of water, 
then absolutely the relative permeability of, of uh, the, the wetting fluid. So as you, as you shrink to 0% uh, water, which would be this point, the relative permeability of the, the non-wetting fluid goes to 100%, and the portion of water goes to 0, and you expect to exactly get that. If you look at series flow, then I'm not sure you can really draw it on this diagram because uh, you don't have those coordinates. But you can imagine that part way between parallel flow and series flow, you have a portion as you go from left to right that goes from wetting to non-wetting to wetting again. And so the reason for this curve being kind of non-ideal, not this X flow, is one that you have these no-go regions in the irreducible saturation zones and also these don't sum to 100% because part of the flow regime is occluded uh, as it goes across from upstream to downstream. And therefore, and I suppose the final thing that is relevant on this plot is that the height of this component here is lower than this height here. And the reason for this is that the, uh, the non-wetting fluid first invades the larger pores. So we made the argument before that if we have invasion of the fluid, the fluid will take the largest possible entry pore, and that will represent the bubbling pressure as it goes into that pore. And so um, the non-wetting fluid will occupy the body of the pore after it's squeezed through the pore throat. And since the pore throat that it invades are the largest pore throats first, the permeability of those pores is also relatively larger than the small pores which are left with the wetting fluid in them. And so the, the manifestation uh, is that the relative permeability of the non-wetting fluid, which is in larger proportion here, is higher than the, mag the portion of the, the pore space which is invaded with the, uh, the wetting fluid. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And so that's it, I think. Um, I, I don't know. I guess there was one other thing on here that I was going to mention, and I can mention, which is right at the bottom. And that is the, the, the reason for wanting to do this is that if we have If we have fluid that is flowing, so we might imagine that water is flowing through this chimney. We know that this chimney isn't 100% occluding the pore space to flow of water in this system. And so we have water going through these tortuous paths, dissolving the non-aqueous phase liquid and carrying it downstream as a plume. And so if we wanted to know what the rate at which we remove the mass that's dissolved from the static material here, we could calculate the mass rate of removal is going to be the mass rate of water flow multiplied by its concentration, purely and simply. So if we know what the Darcy velocity is, then the volumetric flux of water is going to be equal to the area multiplied by the Darcy velocity. And so the area would just be the end area of, of this cylinder, or the total height of your section if you're doing it for this total height. If we know what the Darcy flow velocity is from knowing, whoops, didn't mean to do that. We know that the Darcy velocity is equal to minus the area, not the area, the relative permeability to the saturation of water multiplied by the permeability of the aquifer divided by the viscosity of water multiplied by the pressure gradient in the x direction. And so if we knew what the pressure gradient was in driving flow from left to right, So we know this. We know the permeability of our rock 
doesn't matter what the fluid is. We know the viscosity of the water, which is the carrier fluid that's dissolving the stuff in as it goes downstream. And we'd know the relative permeability of the rock from knowing what its um, saturation is merely by referring to the value here. If we know what the saturation is, then we know this, the relative permeability of the water would be some value here. And that's, that's the, the calculation that we'd want to do to be able to get not only the flow of water across our system, but also the, f the mass that's removed from that static plume that's dissolved in water and carried downstream to a compliance point. And so that can be calculated from what we've talked about today. So the summary is that these three curves, two curves really, go together. Just the, bo the bottom two are uh, the relevant ones. Um, they are defined in terms of their shape because we have these zones where either water is isolated on the pores and not in connection across the, the full body of the porous medium or Annapolis on either sides of this. They condition the form of these capillary pressure versus saturation curves, not allowing us really to get into these forbidden zones, if you like. And that intrinsically linked is the saturation, not only to the capillary pressure. The pres capillary pressure would be the difference in pressure between the red and the green zones as you go across them here. So this would be the pressure in the wetting fluid. This would be the pressure in the non-wetting fluid. And the capillary pressure would be equal to the non-wetting pressure minus the, the wetting pressure. So that could be different in these two. But typically, the gradients that are causing flow in each of these the pressure gradient in fluid number one and I've run out of space here and the pressure gradient in fluid number two the, the magnitudes of these differentials between upstream and downstream would be roughly the same they're coming from the same magnitude the difference between the pressures across this interface might be different, but the gradients that are driving flow would be ostensibly the same. And the different rates in flow that come out of here is due mainly, not due to the different pressure gradients, but it's due to the different relative permeabilities, a property of the porous medium. And I guess I didn't say anything about this, and it doesn't occur on the other figure, is that in the same way that we expect, that we know that the capillary pressure versus saturation curves are hysteretic. So that means that at any given saturation, it matters how we got there, whether we came up this path or whether we came down this path, because we'd end up with different saturations. The same applies for the relative permeabilities that it matters how we got to this saturation as that controls the magnitude of the relative permeability. Don't need to talk about that today. We'll talk about it next time. But the, the important thing, I guess really the important thing, is to understand this expression here, which you'll get to use in due course. And I suppose the other thing that's related to this capillary pressure versus uh, saturation curve uh, would be to realize uh, if we go back through these notes I can't remember when we talked about relative saturations we had a nice curve that showed the different saturations seems a million years ago now um, but we talked about funicular and pendular saturations we made the point that if you suck, so the, the white fluid here is water, the, the solvent, the non-wetting fluid is oil, so it's suspended as a little bubble of oil in the wetting fluid. If you suck fluid out of here, all that you're going to suck out is going to be the, um, the, wa the water in this particular case. You'll be leaving the oil in place. And as much as you want to suck out the water, 
and keep on sucking at a large pressure gradient, it's going to be pretty difficult to pull out this bubble of oil that's left here. And that is what is em embodied in the relative permeability curves that go to zero, that for this relatively low saturation of the non-wetting fluid, the relative permeability is essentially zero because the non-wetting fluid isn't connected between the upstream and downstream as you're trying to suck it out. And so the relative permeability curves are really just a, perhaps a, a tabulated manifestation of the fact that you can't suck this bubble out. Try as you like, you'll put some shear stresses on this bubble by flowing water past it very quickly, but they won't be enough to physically squeeze it out of this gap and move it out of it. And so the remediation options that you have are dictated by what you can remove in this particular saturation by just dissolving the stuff in water and removing it. And as you'll find out, if you can only dissolve this in water at parts per million or parts per thousand, then even if you flow a lot of water through this, it's going to take a very long time to dissolve this bubble, even at relatively low saturations out of here. This saturation here, both the water and the oil are connected across both, and so you'd suck and you'd bring out the napple out of the system, which is great. You'd remediate it by pulling out free product in this saturation here. Um, and as you remove more and more napple, you'd move towards this state here. And in this case, this is great. You'd be, have a ton of gasoline in the subsurface. You'd suck and you'd only get gasoline out of it and no water would come out. And that's great. You could run your car on the gasoline that you sucked out of this because not very much water would be coming out at all. And so relative permeability is how to understand the, the behavior that we get in that. So we've looked at two things. Capillary pressure versus saturation. The curves go directly on top of each other. This is the the way we can think of them. This is in terms of equilibrium behavior, held by capillary forces, won't move, and will only change saturation if you change the capillary pressures. In other words, the pressure differential between these two fluids. If you're flowing fluids under equilibrium saturations in each of these, the rates at which those fluids remove was controlled by the relative permeability and they're controlled directly through this uh, region here. In this particular case, the amount of the non-wetting fluid that you'll remove, because the relative permeability is zero, then this term here has to be zero, and the velocity is zero. So that's just earmarked in that. So next time, we'll talk about understanding a bit more about the real form of those curves, um, as shown here, I guess. and how some of the things that we've already talked about would rationalize the magnitudes of the... Yeah. So we'll talk about the form of those curves next time and then how we might use them to be able to do calculations and also how we might define permeability for rocks in which the largest features, the most conductive features that we're worried about might not be the pore throats in porous media but might be the actual fractures in fractured rocks which not only would act as highways to get the resaturating fluids into the system, but also would act as very fast pathways to flow fluids through, through Darcy's Law. So that's what we'll, we'll talk about next time.